welcome to our Google Club, celebrating 125 years of exploration. Hello, and welcome to our live National Geographic Google Plus Hangout. My name is Catherine. I work at National Geographic. And today we are celebrating National Geographic's Great Nature Project and the Earth's biodiversity with four incredible explorers. So joining me today is photographer and National Geographic explorer Joel Sartori. Joel has um, produced more than 30 uh, stories as a freelance photographer for the magazine and also created Photo Arc, which documents the planet's uh, vanishing biodiversity. And we're going to hear more about Photo Arc and Joel's work in our conversation. We also have joining us from India, where it is certainly bedtime, uh, National Geographic explorer Kriti Karanth. Kriti works on human wildlife conflict, particularly um, with some of the iconic species that we find in India, like tigers. So Kriti, welcome. Thank you for staying up tonight. Um, we also have joining us from Ecuador, so this is truly a global hangout, conservation biologist and National Geographic explorer, Andrea Marshall. Andrea is down there because she leads conservation efforts for manta rays um, and therefore has earned the name of the Manta Queen. So joining us from Ecuador, thank you and hello, Andrea. And um, joining us in a little bit here, we're going to get a call from the wildlife naturalist and host of Nat Geo Wild's America the Wild, Casey Anderson. Um, Casey is up in Alaska right now, up on the Beaufort Sea, and we're having a little trouble with our satellite connection, so we'll expect to hear from Casey soon. Casey, are you there? Can you hear us, Casey? Okay. We'll, we'll wait to hear from Casey in just, in just a minute. You can see him there um, in the thumbnail with the grizzly bear, Brutus, who he'll tell us more about in a bit. And we want to hear from you as well, so please join us by posting and tweeting your questions on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google+, using the hashtag Let's Explore. So let's delve into it, uh, explorers. And if we could just start out, let's move the conversation into your motivations. I know people are joining the Hangout and wondering, how did you become passionate about doing what you do, studying the species and the biodiversity um, that you focus on? So let's start there. Uh, Andrea, can you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to work with giant manta rays? I've been in love with the ocean uh, since I was a little girl. There's nothing that I ever wanted to do than um, be a marine biologist. Um, and I was very influenced by people like Sylvia Earle, who traveled the, the world, um, you know, exploring the oceans really before anyone else did. Um, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I was passionate about the ocean environment, and therefore you can't help but want to actually protect it. Um, and I gravitated towards sharks when I was younger. Um, I found them fascinating, a fascinating group. Uh, moved over into manta rays and did a PhD and whatnot. And, and uh, the more I started working with these iconic marine animals, ones that need protection that are threatened species, the more I realized that um, I really needed to, 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 to as a researcher, to, to bring more um, to the table in, with regards to, to research to help protect these animals that oftentimes are very elusive and no one really knows much about them. So the more science that we can do, the better that we, we can manage them and protect them in our oceans. Right, and we're going to hear about in a little bit, these are incredible creatures, 3,000 pound uh, manta rays. Uh, can you tell us some of the weird, bizarre, <laughs> interesting facts about the rays that you study? They're so much bigger than people, I think, um, realize. Uh, you know, I, I'm swimming around with them in Ecuador at the moment, and even, even uh, you know, though that I spend every single day with them, I'm gobsmacked oftentimes. I was swimming underneath one, blowing bubbles on it just the other day. It was almost giving it like a spa bath. Um, and, it, and it dwarfs you. I mean, they're, they're six, seven meters uh, across um, and these huge diamond-shaped animals that just um, are so gentle. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine walking up to uh, an animal on land that's completely wild and that size and not having fear. Um, but right. you, you never, ever experience fear in the water with these animals just because they, you can see that they're so gentle. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's just it's awe inspiring, um, and it's a really really neat animal to um, be working on. They're very intelligent. So of all of the fish, uh, they have the very largest uh, brain, 
uh, to body uh, uh, ratio. So they have the largest brain of any fish. They're very intelligent animals, very inquisitive. And they're very much like humans. I think that's what a lot of people, when they start to understand more about them, they feel a connection. These are animals that are slow to mature. They only have one baby at a time. Um, like, like us, they don't even have babies every year. So, um, you know, this is an animal that, that lives uh, in, a, in similar ways to humans um, in, in many cases. And because of that, they are facing extreme pressure worldwide because they don't have enough offspring uh, to be able to survive some of the pressure that, that we humans place on them. Um, so the more you learn about them, the more you realize that this is a really incredible animal that, that deserves to be protected. Excellent. Yeah, and, and speaking of iconic, large uh, megafauna, Kriti, you focus on human wildlife conflict, particularly in around protected areas in the Western Ghats. What what drew you to this, and and what drew to you, particularly to your focus on, can we say, on tigers and tiger conservation, living in close proximity to humans? Well, I I had, I had a pretty unusual childhood. I grew up uh, from the age of one. I've been running around in a lot of parks with my dad, watching tigers and elephants and a lot of iconic species. But I think it was, uh, and I mean, when I was eight years old, got to watch my dad collar and track tigers. But I think the real sort of this is what I want to do with my life moment came when I was 22 years old and doing field work in the guards for my own research, which was looking at impacts of, that people were having on the guards. And I realized that you have this incredible landscape that's home to 20 million people, yet has, I mean. For you know, twenty percent of the world's tigers and a whole lot of other interesting creatures. Um, one of the research projects we have, um, looking at you know frogs and birds uh, right now in landscapes around the parks actually, and we're we're rediscovering frog species that people haven't seen in seventy five years. We're discovering new frog species that people haven't you know even are discovering for the first time. So I think you know. People think of the big iconic tigers and elephants, but I think there's a lot of amazing biodiversity still left in a huge parts of the world waiting to be discovered. Good point. I mean, the Western Ghats are one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, right? Meaning an incredible yeah. species area and also facing threats. So good to remember there's a lot left to explore uh, and discover. Mm -hmm. Joel, uh, what about you? How did you? Um, get your start or the focus on photo arc and why is this project of particular importance um, at this time uh, in, in particular? Sure, I've, I've been a uh, contributing photographer for National Geographic for about for more than 20 years now and I've done about 35 stories I think and um, I, uh, I just see the world filling up with people. We're past 7 billion now on our way to 8 or 9 or 10 billion people and the projections are that if we don't start being better stewards of the earth, we're going to lose half of all species by 2100. And the best plan I've heard for anybody, they say, well, we'll be dead by then. Well, that, that's not a real plan. That's not good. So, so I just figure, well, I think that a lot of this stuff's in trouble. A lot of these species are in trouble because nobody's ever heard of them. They don't know they exist. Mm -hmm. We focus a lot on sporting events, on the price at the pump, on what's on television but we don't really think about the natural world. So the photo arc is basically a huge, I don't know if it's an online dating service exactly, but it's certainly an arc and it's, it's a way of getting people engaged and uh, the first step towards caring is to know something exists and maybe it's in trouble. And so we've come up with a website called photoarc.com, arc spelled with a K, photoarc.com. And we hope people will come there and fall in love with some of these species. There's everything from the smallest insects to elephants. I mean, anything we can, we can get. The goal is to get um, all the species in captivity. Uh, not that I have any great fondness for captivity, but um, it is a way of getting a lot of species quickly. And we've done about 3,000 species in the past eight years on our way to hopefully 10 or 12,000. I should also say this about zoos and, and, and captive situations that for many species now they only exist in zoos. In fact, a great deal of the species that I've photographed over the years, the very rare ones, would be extinct by now if it weren't for captain, captive breeding efforts. So when people say, what can I do? They can support their local zoo. Um, zoos truly are the ark now. Going forward, they're going to be more and more important in terms of preserving species uh, with good genetic diversity until we get smart enough to manage the earth well so these animals can go back into the wild. Right. And, and Joel, I should also note that you are the spokesperson 
for the Great Nature Project, um, the theme of today's Hangout Among Us. Um, and we're going to get back to that in just a second. We have Casey Anderson is on the line. Casey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Welcome. So you're at the tip top of Alaska. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing up there. And also, in this picture here, we're seeing you with a, a rather large grizzly bear. Uh, we know his name is Brutus. Can you tell us a bit about your relationship to Brutus and to the American West um, and, the, and the American West wildlife as well? Absolutely, yeah. I'm actually, I wish I was in that photo right now because I'm standing in the middle of a blizzard. It's too early to be having a blizzard. But uh, I'm up here hanging out with the polar bears. Uh, there's been a whale carcass uh, harvested, uh, a whale harvested by the Inupia people here and the Beaufort Sea, and for 4,500 years, this village has uh, harvested several bowhead whales, uh, usually three a year, and for 4,500 years, uh, during the hungriest times, the polar bears have come and basically picked up the scraps. But something new is happening here. Uh, we're seeing with the changing climate that the grizzly bears are moving north and also taking advantage of this, this large food source. And now we're seeing a... a an overlap of two species that haven't haven't done that in a long time, and we're seeing them interact, and uh, even a little uh, hybridization happening. Um, so there's a, a changing a changing tides up here, and of course uh, bears are pretty near and dear to my heart. Obviously, rescuing Brutus 11 years ago, um, I have kind of a unique perspective. You know, the funny thing is, I echo everything that. Uh, Everybody's said so far, you know, we do this because we love the wild. And, you know, the funny thing is, you know, you see me sitting there with a captive bear, but you know, the truest, you know, part of my heart is basically that everything needs to be wild and free. And we need to have those wild places um, where these animals can live. But like Joel said, it's like there is an awareness that is and a gift that Brutus has given me that I, I could never get here, you know, with the bears in the wild. You know, it's that, it's that gift, that glimpse in the soul and, and, and the, the emotion and the intelligence of an animal that, fortunately for me, having to raise this little orphan bear, it, it gave me this unique perspective. It made me want to care. It made me, it made me give uh, more value and depth to everything that lives, you know, just by having that kind of invisible gift that Brutus gave me. So it's, it makes me fight harder than ever when I look out at these wild bears. I mean, I know... They can feel, they can think, they can do the things that Bruce does. I mean, I, I, it's it's really hard to to uh, translate that without experience, you know, having to experience it. So my goal now is to make TV shows to show people that there is this other depth of these animals. There's they are valuable. I mean, most people do not know about most wildlife, and if they do, big things like manta rays and grizzly bears. They fear it, and why protect something that you're afraid of? And that's what my, I'm trying to cure the fear and change it into respect. Yeah, that's fantastic. Demystify a species um, that the public might be afraid of. I, I think one of the real uh, virtues of the Great Nature Project is that we can only care about what we know, right? And the Great Nature Project encourages us to get outside and to explore the incredible biodiversity in our backyard, whether that backyard is Ecuador, Nebraska, the Western Ghats, um, or very far north uh, in Alaska. So Joel, as, as spokesperson for the Great Nature Project, um, can you tell us what is this project and, um, and what are people supposed to be doing um, to contribute to this project right now? Absolutely. You know, um, I think this is a great idea, actually. It's just encouraging people to get up off the couch, get out into the daylight, and see that there's nature all around us no matter where you live. Um, you don't need to be a professional photographer. You could, use a, you could use a smartphone to just get out in the backyard. You can photograph insects on flowers if you like or praying mantis or spiders or anything. We're trying to create the world's largest online photo album of animals in a one-week period. So the, the deadline is Sunday night and we've already got about 30,000 pictures of animals online at greatnatureproject.org. That's where you can go to, to download pictures, and it's very simple. And let's say, let's say you don't have a backyard to go to. Well, then you go to, a, go to a city park, someplace where there's still a semblance of nature. If you stop and look, you'll see good things to photograph. 
and you could always go to a local zoo or aquarium. Those are really visually loaded places. If you think about it, all the animals are lined up for you to actually view. So no excuse not to participate. The price is sure right. It's free. And uh, we might set a Guinness record. We need 100,000 pictures again by Sunday night. And that's hashtag great nature on your that's right. That's right. Or hashtag animal or go to greatnatureproject.org. Excellent. And I think we're going to queue up uh, a video here about the Great Nature Project. Maybe, maybe not. Find incredible nature. All you have to do is go outside. National Geographic invites you to celebrate nature. Join the Great Nature Snap a photo of a plant or animal in your world. Upload it to your favorite photo sharing sites using the hashtag Great Nature. See it? Snap it. Upload it. Join National Geographic's Great Nature Project today. And you know there's some there's some really well seen pictures already up there and very surprising. I love the fact that that people see so differently. It's really interesting to me and it gives mm -hmm. me a lot of ideas too on how to shoot things that I see every day that I never it never would have occurred to me. So it's very fun and it's interesting and, and hopefully it gets people just engaged in the world around us and, and realize, you know, it's 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 uh, there's not a whole lot of time to lose in terms of getting us to care about nature, especially for species that are rare. So um, hopefully this stirs public interest and we'll get a hundred thousand pictures at least by Sunday night. Yes, and just to further, yeah, Andrea, please. Oh, I just think it's a great thing for families to do together as well. You know, I've been trying to encourage it in this tiny little fishing village in Ecuador, but I, I'd like families all over the world to say to their kids, hey, let's go do something, you know, and, and to be a part of something bigger, you know, to be able to take your kids outside, you know, get them outside, get them uh, walking around, get them, you know, looking at animals and taking photos and then doing something with it, you know. It's nice to, to actually see it being, being used for something, um, and... Uh, who wouldn't want to be involved in, in a project that could potentially break a Guinness uh, Book World Record? So um, I think it would just be a great thing for families around the world to get together, go do something healthy and fun outside. Absolutely. And, you know, just to, to further the point that we have nature all around us, we did a, a walk in downtown D.C. last week and snapped tons of pictures of the insects, the plants, uh, squirrels, birds. Um, there's certainly more nature around us, even if we're not in a pristine um, area or in a remote corner of the world. So um, it's certainly worth getting outside and participating in the Great Nature Project. And what might seem ordinary to you is extraordinary to someone else. You know, even the common squirrel to, you know, to, in, to someone in Northern America is a really rare species in other parts of the world to someone else. So don't forget that just because, you know, this animal may look common to you and it's in your backyard, um, that it's a, still an important animal, it should be celebrated, and someone else on the other side of the world might find it incredibly interesting. Good point. And I think uh, people also realize that there's, you know, new species, so many things to, yet to be discovered. I think people, there's particular taxonomic groups where we, we haven't even tapped the diversity of life. And I think it's really, really important that people go explore places where even 20 million people live. The fact that you can find, you know, 20 new frog species this year is pretty remarkable. And not just new species, too. I mean, that you make a valuable point, but also range extensions. And I want to explain that, because as a scientist, that's important to someone like me. But, you know, an animal that may be well-known to occur in one area, and no one's ever seen it in the area that you're in. And by you taking that photo and uploading it online um, and sharing that that animal lives in that location, to a scientist, that's incredibly important information. Um, so there's so many different ways that your photos can contribute, and it's just so easy to do and, and fun, really. Yeah, good point. Um, I'm going to bring in a question now from um, the internet. Um, we have one, Casey Anderson, for you up there in Alaska. Um, our question comes from Colby McAlrath from the United States, um, who asked on the Explorers Journal blog that he's a uh, zoology student studying grizzly bears in captivity. And he's wondering about your opinion on the prospect of using aversion learning techniques to keep bears out of dumpsters. Yeah, you know, the key to a bear's heart is food, and unfortunately, going out in the wild and finding 20,000 calories of berries, grubs, and moths is not easy. So if somebody 
leave some garbage out. There's a cheese bread and a dumpster. It's a no-brainer for a bear. He's going to go there, and you know, it's an easy, easy meal. Um, <laughs> problem is, yeah, they, it's you know, they habituated to that. It's a, it becomes a bit of a habit, and uh, it's easy. And, and so they're being conditioned, obviously, po- you know, positively. And there's so many ways you can do the adver- adverse conditioning. And the one that's been working a lot is just basically bear-proof containers, bear-proof dumpsters that bears can't get into. And once they can't get into and, and don't get that reward, they stop going there and start going back to their natural food sources. But you can take it to the next level, and one that works well is uh, electric fences. Electric fences work really great. Grizzly bears, brown bears, uh, black bears, polar bears, they all not like like you have around uh, you know, horse corrals. You know, they go in there, they in with their nose, very sensitive, they get a little zap, they run away, and they don't ever want to do that again. And people are putting around their beehives, their orchards, all kinds of things. You know, and it, you know, a part of being, you know, being part of the world, uh, we as humans have, you know, the tools to, to coexist. And to not just be lazy and not do anything, we we can do little things that can make a big difference. And uh, for a bear, you know, that's it's important for them to go back out to the wild and try to do what they can to eat the, their natural food. Kriti, can you speak to the spirit of that question a little bit in areas um, in your part of the world, uh, in the Western Ghats, where humans and wildlife uh, overlap? What are some of the techniques or, or methods that you and your team have employed or are, local people are employing maybe um, to mitigate some of the human-wildlife conflicts? So we just finished a 2,000 ho- household survey in the Ghats and unfortunately people are trying, you know, trenches and ditches and solar fences and even planting rows of particular crops. But what the study showed was most of these mitigation measures were really ineffective and so we were coming out and saying you know in conservation we spend so so much money investing in mitigation measures without really evaluating stuff so one of the things we we're coming out um, very strongly saying is that you really need to spend a little more time evaluating things besides before you know, broadly uh, prescribing that every every farmer go out and fence their land because in the case of elephants, the fencing doesn't really work, you know. And um, so there's, I mean, there's. I feel like there's a lot of uh, um, conservation monies going towards this kind of mitigation without really thought into whether it should be done in the first place or not. So evaluating if methods are working before we prescribe it for you know. 200, 300, 400,000 people to use. Yeah, I think it, it, people need to step back a little bit before before doing that. Yeah. Andrea, what about the species that you that you study? Um, how do manas interact with humans? Um, are, are there any problems um, in human manta interactions in the wild? It's interesting you're asking me this question where I'm sitting right now, which is in Ecuador. Ecuador has probably been the most involved country in the entire world in, with regards to manta ray conservation. They um, found this. Uh, we found this really huge population of manta rays off the coastline, pretty much the world's largest known population of the giant manta. Um, Ecuador was quick to protect them. Ecuador was quick to propose them on both the Convention for Migratory Species Act and also CITES uh, earlier this year, um, both of them passing successfully, helping to protect mantas internationally. And yet, in their own country now, despite being protected, we're seeing so many mantas being entangled, uh, cut up with hooks in them, um, and swimming around with just giant nets uh, all over them. Um, and so even in a place where they've very, uh, they, they've definitely um, aimed to protect this particular animal, we're still seeing them coming into conflict with, with humans as they're trying to fish uh, the oceans. And Ecuador is really concerned about this now, trying to figure out how they can uh, mitigate those issues, as you were just talking about now with these other terrestrial animals. And it's difficult because humans and, and animals do come in contact. Um, and how do you uh, protect the interests of humans and also you know, maintain these wild places where these animals can have these critical habitats and feel safe in them. Um, and these are really gentle animals. So especially uh, with regards to bears and, and tigers where people feel fear, there's nothing to fear with regards to mantis at all. Um, and so the fishermen themselves say, hey, we don't want to catch these animals. And they're, they're asking scientists, what can we do? What tackle can we not use? You know, can we fish in, in, in certain areas and not others to try and 
um, protect these animals, which they also um, feel, you know, they love these animals. They don't want to hurt them. But it's sometimes difficult to understand how to protect underwater animals if you're not actually seeing what the problems are. So it's, you know, it's an ongoing process. But I think what's important is, um, as we're talking about this Great Nature Project, is if people love animals, if you can get people connected to animals and nature, they want to work through these problems. They want to come up with solutions. But the real question is, is how to get people to love these animals. And I think a lot of these projects, the ARC project or this particular Great Nature Project, are great ways of, of getting people connected to nature. Well, I think this leads in nicely with um, another question we have coming in from social media. This is from Inbal Gamliel, who wrote in from Israel on Facebook and said, um, and I'll just lob this up generally to each of you. How, do you have advice to someone who wants to get involved in the field? Uh, is it difficult to find a research subject? So what would you say to a, a young explorer, somebody who's looking to have an impact on the planet, um, to get involved in biodiversity conservation? How does one go about getting into the field? I, I mean, I, I don't want to talk too much, but I am still very young, um, and I feel like I just went through this period of my life myself. I don't know if you guys were tuned in before when I was talking about how I fell into this field, but I was always interested in sharks. And as I moved to Africa, I saw an opportunity to study manta rays. It's not a species that I specifically wanted to study when I was younger, but I saw this great opportunity to study an animal that had not been studied before. And for people who think that it's hard to find an animal that no one's done work on before, it's not. There are so many species that, as she uh, as Kriti pointed out earlier, have, are just being discovered. Uh, there's a lot of things still left to do. Um, you just have to find a niche, and even if the animal's been worked at, on before, find a new perspective of how to look at that animal or look at that animal's habitat or problems uh, related to that animal. Um, I have a lot of students now doing work on mantas all over the world. We found new species of mantas. Can you imagine finding a new species of manta just a couple of years ago in, in, a, in a day and age where we think we've discovered everything on the planet? Um, there's a lot left to discover still. There's a lot left to study still. You shouldn't feel any fear as a student to be able to just keep pursuing um, your studies, keep pursuing your passion, and something will fall in line. You'll see an opportunity and grab that opportunity and run with it. Great. And Casey, you wanted to jump in on this one as well. Yeah, I always like to say uh, dust the books off and get your boots muddy. I mean, get educated, learn, you know, read, study, and then get out there and apply it. You know, I, I can't. I can't say it enough. You know, kids are always ask me, "How can you be? I gotta be the next guy." That's you know, it's just get out there. Find you know, find the person whose job you think is the best job in the world. Go up to them, say, "Hey, I'll carry your backpack around for a week for free." Get out there, experience, see it. You know, explore. I mean, never be afraid. And you know, it's you get immersed out there. The passion just gets fueled. You make that connection, uh, and You've got that dream job. I, I always tell people that, you know, it's uh, you literally have one life, so what is it that you want to do? Don't worry about what you're supposed to do or what other people are telling you you should do. What is it you want to do? And then and then literally go do it. I'm, I'm just a guy from Nebraska. I mean, I'm no smarter than anybody else, believe me. A lot less smart than a lot of people. But what I, what I do have in common with the other geographic photographers I know is we're all very type A. We're, we're very self-motivated. If you're self-motivated, there's no excuse for you not to do exactly what you want to with your life. Truly. I mean, uh, there are no excuses, really. If you're motivated, if you're a type A type of person, you can do whatever you want, pretty much. So um, uh, I'd say just echo what everybody else is saying and, and just go out and do it. And find somebody who is, in the case of photography, find somebody who's doing the kind of work that you want to do and then just go live with them. Camp out, sweep the floors, haul lights whatever it takes, and uh, eventually you'll, you'll be in. But it takes, it takes a lot of work. It's not for the faint of heart, but if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? <laughs> I, I want to plug out there that we're, um, we're almost at the limit here of our Google Hangout. So it's a last call for questions. If you want to send in any last-minute questions onto Google+, Facebook, or Twitter, um, hashtag Let's Explore. We'll try to get to them in our last few minutes here. Um, and Joel, actually, if I just can go right back to you, you've documented now more than 3,000 species for photo arc. Right. Um, could you just tell us a favorite? Uh, what, what, what was a, what was an awesome photographic encounter you had with maybe a species some of us don't know as well or wouldn't or wouldn't think about? 
Well, you know, I always say my favorite's the next one because I'm very excited about every one I do, whether it's a moth or it's a tiger, believe it or not. It's, they're, they're all good. Um, one of the most poignant was I photographed an animal that's still alive. It's at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. It's the very last rabs fringed limbed tree frog. It's about the size of my hand. Uh, it was discovered in Panama as chytrid fungus was sweeping through, and this is the very last one. They couldn't really pull off captive breeding on it. Amphibi amphibians are complicated. So they've named this one Tuffy because he's at least 10 years old now, and, that, and he's hanging on pretty well for a frog. But, but it's, it's very moving when you're in front of the very last of something, and you know that when it's gone, the species will be extinct. And it's, it's hard to really um, express myself how you feel in front of an animal like this other than sad and angry and you really would like the world to wake up and realize what's going on and um, and pay a little less attention to the price of the pump and how this how your favorite team's doing and care about all these other species I mean I try to uh, I try to get the word out as best I can I photographed a couple other things that have gone extinct now and um, the world isn't paying nearly enough attention and it's really an outrage so that's why I do what I do but how incredible that you're documenting it, and again, you know, um, you say just get out there and do it. You know, people don't know how what the impact um, they can have with their photos too, and people should really see you as as a great ambassador for wildlife, and they can, you know, try their hand at it this week. You know, they can go out and try and take a picture of something that looks rare or different and, and upload it. You never know how, how, how you may, may make a difference. That's right, and I, you know, I, I'm under no illusions that the photo arc will save everything, but I'm hoping we'll save a few things. And above all, I hope that the photo arc doesn't just become a, a visual history of what we squandered. That's, that's really what I want to try to avoid. So, yeah, the Great Nature Project is, uh, is an excellent way of reconnecting people. And if you think about it, every, every generation that comes along, we're a little, at least in North America, we're less connected to the land than we were. And um, it's, it's harder to find a body of water to, to grow up catching tadpoles or playing in as a kid. Um, a lot more fear and mistrust of our fellow humans. Uh, we're worried about all the things we see on 24-hour-a-day news cycles in terms of you can't let your kids go outside anymore. It's not safe. Well, that's not that's just not right, and it's it's no way to survive as a species. We I really believe that we have to reconnect with nature if we're going to make it ourselves. So, this is a the Great Nature Project's a very good thing, and and just and just studying studying people who's who are doing things that you really think are amazing. Um, my own children watch a lot of television, and I always say, why watch that person do something cool? Why not be the person on television? You know, why not go out and do that yourself? There's no excuses, really, why you shouldn't. What an excellent sentiment to end on, um, that we're all explorers, and that we can all join Andrea and Joel and Kriti and Casey in documenting and exploring the Earth's biodiversity. And we invite you and National Geographic to do that with us. Go to greatnatureproject.org and share your photos or upload them on any photo sharing site with the hashtag Great Nature. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today and then um, also tell you guys that we have our next Hangout, which is not to be missed, on October 16th. We'll be talking to a National Geographic photographer and photo editor about what we talked about today in some ways, the power of photography. Um, to change the world. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And with that, we'll say goodbye and good night, Kriti. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.